Akbar uh, presentation is shorter than I'll speak to you before the prayer, but we're going to make Asr and we're going to make Maghrib here, inshallah. Um, if you're here, if you have to go, that's understandable. But at this moment, I think it's important that we bring on my brother, Dr. Akbar, who I think will be able to give us a very excellent historical perspective of the majesty of King and the life of Malcolm and the times in which we live now. So with your patience and endurance for the Akbar. So. And, and by the way, I need you to hang out a little bit because we have some awards for brothers and sisters that are here, that we want to acknowledge them for their service, inshallah, to the community. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, I bear witness there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of God. I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum. First, I want to thank Allah for blessing me to be here uh, this afternoon and to sit over there. And I really sat and I learned. Instead of uh, thinking that I'm going to speak, I was listening, and we had these brilliant presentations. And I think that everyone here learned. I'm going to try to be brief, which is very difficult for me. Okay? Because um, I got many, many stories. But I'm glad to see you here, those who could uh, stay. And I want to start with two things. One is uh, Imam Abdul Malik um, from Brooklyn. And the fact that when Minister Farrakhan made his Hajj, he was the brother that led Minister Farrakhan through the Hajj. And many of our Muslim brothers from America who were in Mecca for the first or second time, they had a problem with him. And uh, they had a problem to the degree they were saying he shouldn't be in Mecca, but they didn't let him in Mecca. The people who run Mecca let him in Mecca. And uh, they didn't open that door. But it's a shame for us to be thousands of miles away and we all come out of basically the same womb and be enemies with one another. I want to start there. Because if we're going to do anything, we got to get along with one another and stop arguing over al Aqida and what you believe and so forth. I took a drive this morning and yesterday after the mosque meeting. And I want to thank uh, Brother Minister Hafiz, who is here, uh, for a wonderful meeting that uh, he had for me at the mosque. But I took a drive because I realized that time is not on my side. And I took a drive through my old neighborhood uh, in the Bronx, the Patterson Projects, uh, where I grew up, um, Combs, uh, Melvin Combs, Puffy's father. We grew up together in the Patterson Projects. Then I drove around the area and I looked how everything has changed. And I didn't know if I would get back to see that area again. And then I went out to Queens. And I drove through my old neighborhood. I lived in South Jamaica, then I moved to Hollis. Then I drove down to Linden and Farmers and up that way so that I could take a look at where I grew up in the area that developed me. I was living in Queens at 18 years old when I went to the mosque to hear now. And I, it was at a time in our struggle, the civil rights movement and all that was going on. And I took that drive so that I could look back and reflect what I was doing in the street that I thought was important. And then I heard something that moved me and I wanted to be involved in the struggle. I remember Martin Luther King uh, came to the uh, church on New York Boulevard, Guy Brewer now. The church was packed. I had to stand in the window in order to hear him, but it was a time in history. It was a movement going on that was going to change what we were doing and what we had suffered in America. I chose the Nation of Islam because I, want, I loved that militant side. You know, all, everybody in the street, we want to fight. Nothing draws Negroes like a good fight. And in those days, we didn't go get a Mac-10. I mean, we may have developed a little zip gun that wouldn't hurt nobody, 
And those brothers who are old enough, the Over the Hill Gang, you know what I'm talking about. But we fought. We, we put our fists up and we fought and let the best man win. So I'm saying this, that I chose that direction. And then circumstances and time moved. Malcolm was my minister. And as all of the brothers, I loved him. I was in his first ministry class. There were seven of us, two dropped out, five was left. When Malcolm left the nation, I stayed with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And I stayed with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad because of Malcolm. Malcolm used to say in the class, I don't care what other people do, the man is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Many of you who are sitting here as Muslims right now, your grandfather or someone else came across the bridge given to us by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And I mean, it, it, whether it's in your family, and because you chose a different direction in your enlightened view of Islam, it doesn't mean you curse the bridge or burn the bridge down that brought you about. And it don't mean that you spend your time trying to disprove what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught when our people are going to hell. Our people need the light that you have that pulled you away from the madness of the white man's world, but you want to now spend time you know, studying hadith and, you know, you want to study this tafsir and so forth to try to condemn what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad used to bring you out of the grave of ignorance. So I wanted to say that because in this struggle, we have to get along with one another. When I moved to Africa in 1990, it was a whole new world for me. I understand different tribes and how people work together and people did not work together. I got on a, a cloth today because I heard a program. I was in Dubai and I ran into D.D. Bridgewater. She was there singing and she was dressed in an African dress. She had went to Mali and in Mali she was inspired by the singers because the root of some of our music comes directly from Mali. And uh, Mali, there was a program this morning on Afropop, if you pull it up, Mali will probably be the first nation on the African continent of the 54 nations that will elect an imam as the leader of that country. What, what, are, you, what are you talking about, Akbar? I'm talking about that we must work together. The Muslims now are suffering throughout the world. Look at the Muslim world, complete chaos. How could the king invite Trump to come to Riyadh, to talk to the Muslim world like they're children. And they sit there and listen to him. And then they're still fighting and with one another, the killing, the savagery that's going on in Syria and what is happening in Iraq since America destroyed Iraq there in Libya. A basket case, the nation broke up, the infrastructure that he built totally destroyed by Barack Obama siding with them and the Western world. And we're here in America, three million of our people in prison, our young brothers and sisters, and we in the street fighting over an Akita, and most of our mosques are completely empty. They're not packed with people. They don't have no people in there searching. And we battling, and as in the early days, and Malcolm was the leader of this, he talked about storefront churches, enough just to take care of a minister. And what we condemn, we doing the same thing right now. When Imam Muhammad left, we broke up into all of these little different groups. All of us got our little masjids and we the Imam. Those that went overseas and studied came back and felt that they had a greater knowledge of Quran and Hadith, so they should be the Imam. But what do they know about dealing with black folks? What do they know? What do they know? I'm one, but I think that I'm, because I'm a Muslim, I'm a little better. Let me just finish what I wanted to say. <laughs> Dr. Martin Luther King went to Africa. How many in this room know he went to Africa? Could you raise your hand? How many do not know, had no idea that King went to Africa? Very good. I mean, you can be honest, because I didn't know for a while. But because I have been involved in Africa, and my love for Africa, I found out. How many of your children have come home and say, I want to read a speech on, or your grandchildren now, on King, and they give him, I have a dream? Yes. They never give him the, king, the speech that he delivered condemning the Viet Vietnamese War. No. They don't give him that. You should read it sometime, That's right. if you haven't. 
go online. But King did go to Africa. How did he get to Africa? Because he was a reader. And one thing I respect about King, he wrote down his subjects. I went and looked at his uh, intellectual property in Atlanta, Georgia. He wrote sub subjects down, but he didn't deliver a subject. And today we must, as Americans, do this. He delivered it with strength. So King said one day, and if you want to read this, Jim Bishops, the days of Martin Luther King. King needed a vacation. They wanted to send him to Europe. They said, we must send the pastor needs a rest. Paris, London, Germany, Italy. See, that was their mindset. And it was King who said, there's a country in Africa, I believe, it's gonna be independent soon. I'd like to go to Africa. I've never been to Africa. It was out of King's expression. He went to Ghana, March of 1957. And one of the brothers who was there that was, who came to Africa because of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah looked out for King when he got a little sick. And then when King got back, it was a tremendous celebration because all of those involved in the liberation struggle for African nations, they came to Accra, Ghana for that Independence Day. And King had an opportunity to interact with those brothers who were struggling. Then King, King came back to America. And if you're going to celebrate King, celebrate a part of this that most of our people know nothing about. And on April the 7th, 1957, he went to the Dexter Street Baptist Church and delivered a speech, a new nation is born. He talked about what he saw in them trying to build their society. And it's an important part of King's history. A black man named Louis Lomax wrote a book called To Kill a Black Man. It's about Martin Luther King. It's a collector's item now. Holloway Press in California. I sold hundreds of them in my bookstore. I used to own a bookstore with Dr. Salam from Newark called Books and Things on the corner of 116th and Malcolm X Boulevard. And we sold hundreds of those books, a little book. But the book was a key because uh, Louis Lomack, a brilliant brother who helped Malcolm with our first papers. He wrote uh, White Man Listen, Negro Revolution, and When the Word is Given. Unfortunately, he was killed in an accident in New Mexico. But this book was his best book because he showed the two men, and you should read it. He showed Malcolm uh, in the Cairo, Egypt in 1964 at the first summit of the OAU. And the beauty of it in 1960, when 17 African nations became independent, they had to send ambassadors to the UN right here in New York. And Malcolm was smart enough to go down and invite them up to our little Shabazz restaurant. It was our first opportunity that we got to see men and women in African robes. So it made a difference. It was a connection with Africa. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad always said that we're going to separate. I got two things I'm going to try to make keep to my time. I was sitting right before I became a Muslim, 18 years old. Milt Jackson lived in Hollis, Queens, right near my house uh, on 104th Avenue before he moved to Scarsdale. But Milt had a brother who was my age and who was a drummer. And as a young man, I liked jazz, so I used to go over there all the time because Donald Byrd, the people he was real, real tight with was Dizzy Gillespie because he couldn't smoke reef at home, so he would come to Milt's house. His wife would not allow it. And so I met these giants. Thank you. I met these giants. One night I was there, and Milt liked to shoot pool. He played piano and he sung. And one night, Milt was there and I was there, and I, I turned on the radio, I said, I want you to hear this brother, it was Malcolm. And Malcolm was on a roll as he usually is, but he was railing America and talking about that we have to go to a land of our own and build our own society and so forth. And I said to Milt, I felt that, Milt, you should get involved in this and so forth. This is, I'm a young man, and I'm moved. Milt said to me, he said that, uh, Larry, that was my name, he said, Larry, I know all about Muslims. He said, what you have to understand, 
my brother, is people make decisions. I know Muslims and I respect them. He said, but Larry, I'm the kind of person when I want to eat a pork chop, I'm going to eat one. <laughs> That's what he said. And he said, but if it's what rocks your boat and what moves you, get involved in it. And he really encouraged me. And when I had some difficulty, he wrote me a character letter. Now I'm saying this to say to you that Islam has impacted this struggle. Martin Luther King, and I thank Imam Abdul Malik because he was just putting this on for King. But he decided that he should <coughs> add on to it Malcolm X. And uh, it was a great move because many of you don't go to Malcolm celebrations. But when you heard that Malcolm was going to be honored when Abdul Malik came up with this idea, and he is a young activist. He was in uh, Saudi Arabia, and a brother named Dr. Lani X. Cross, you later knew him as Dr. Shabazz, gave him a tape of Minister Farrakhan speaking in a church, Little Rock Baptist Church in Detroit, Michigan. And what happened is he put that tape in and heard it. Now, now Minister Farrakhan wasn't uh, teaching on hadith that day. He wasn't walking through the life of Prophet Muhammad, what he heard. What he heard is a man committed to the struggle of our people and to wake them up, to bring them to life, and to get them in a position to get involved in the struggle and bring something that would keep them away from the pitfalls that we have in America with drugs and vice and crime and low life and partying, which becomes more than the struggle of our people. My last thing that I wrote on here, and the brother gave me a note, I said 1957. Yeah, I was gonna say it is 1957. Okay, when you get older, uh, you know, and the doctor told me this, when you get older, I went to a doctor. And she said, Akbar, how you doing? I'm 75. I said, well, I'm doing fine. She said, well, how's your memory? I said, sister, I'm a historian. I remember a whole lot of stuff. She said, yeah, but how's your short-term memory? Like, where did you put your keys? <laughs> so, so, brother Hafiz, I said that, that the 57 and 60s, I can remember all of that, but don't ask me something about yesterday. I may, I may have a problem. Let me finish this last point. I'm saying this because we got so many lawyers in the room. I, I have a young son, he's uh, 20 years old now. Yes, sir. He's at Howard University. Yes, sir. When he was going to Howard, I wanted him to go into law. And he said, Dad, I don't like lawyers. They, some of them lie and you know, they do that. He said, I don't want to be a lawyer. I said, son, I said, Barack Obama has a law degree, but he doesn't practice law. A lot of your politicians and other people. I said, but law is important, why? And I learned this from attorney Lou Meyer, a movement lawyer. He said that by going to law school, he was forced to read. And the, he developed a habit of reading. Reading made him analytical. That you have to be able to analyze things. You have to know what rational thinking is. And it's very important. This room is full of a lot of lawyers today. And I hope that the lawyers will do what we failed to do. And that's to get young people and mentor them and talk to them. King would have liked to have done it. King would have liked to sit down with young people and talk to them, but he was engaged in the struggle and always on the move. And then the thing about Martin Luther King and his period, and if you get the book that I'm talking about, please get it and read it, To Kill a Black Man. Because Malcolm, in the early days in the nation, we railed on King. I mean, and anybody, you remember those right, days, right. called him a pork chop eating preacher, you know, and so forth. I mean, we were bad. But things change with time. The respect that Minister Farrakhan developed in the last five years for Dr. Martin Luther King is unbelievable. And he got that because he studied his life. He studied uh, Taylor Branch's three books. And Taylor Branch said how James Bevel knew that they had to keep the struggle in the press. They didn't know how to do it because the press was marginalizing what King was doing. And he said, let's put the children in the street. And they got all of the children to demonstrate, but they never thought in their wildest imagination 
that they would sick dogs on those children, beat them with hoses and bats, and then lock them up in jail cells. It got the attention, but the children suffered. But the respect for what they were trying to accomplish in our struggle took a turn. W.E.B. Du Bois, whose body is in Ghana, and I do the tour of his house that is in miserable shape because they don't care about it. And when I go and do that, remember Du Bois was against Garvey. I'm closing out now, Brother Iman. Du Bois was against Garvey. And Garvey was calling him to Africa, but that wasn't him. He was worried about something else in terms of our struggle, but where did he die at? And where did he end up going after America took his passport? When he got his passport back, he poked his tongue at America, went straight to China, where they respected him and loved him. And then Dr. Kwame Nkrumah said, would you come to Ghana and help me to confer doctorate degrees on my people and finish your uh, encyclopedia of Africa? And he accepted that, and he died there. But I want to thank you. It's a great meeting. Brother Imam Malik, you must continue to work. Yes. Use the, your language skills. He went to school um, in Saudi Arabia. Right. He's married to a beautiful sister from Egypt that helps him to keep his Arabic up, and she's a lawyer. And so use the skill not to just deliver your kutbah, but to engage these ambassadors in the Muslim world that has millions and billions of dollars so that we can do some constructive things for our people in this movement to resurrect black men and women in this country. Thank you. May Allah bless you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, brother. Thank you. ITV, call of peace, save humanity.